Good evening, brothers and sisters. And uh, it's nice to be here again to share some more of God's word and look at God's word and as we continue in this new year. And before I get started, um, some of you have already been walking up to me and asking, who is, how many kids, what, what, what? So I want to share uh, some pictures. So this is our family. This is our most current from this summer. And uh, here we go. Uh, this is Zachary, our first biological. Uh, he's 15. He's been baptized two years ago. And then Samuel, he's with us here. He is uh, 13. He's also been baptized. Um, Elichka, she is our only girl and our only flower in our, in our family. Um, she's nine years old. Then we have uh, Joseph, who is six, and Titus, who is three. And uh, the past few years, we adopted Volva, who has been here with us before. This is Vladimir, or Volva. And uh, this past summer, uh, we had uh, two, two more boys added to our family. We adopted them from Ukraine. And this is Kirill. He's 18. He's the oldest in the family. He turned 18 in September. And uh, Volva is 18. He turned 18 in October. And this is Dima. He's our nine-year-old. He's with us, too. So we have two 18-year-olds and two 9-year-olds. And um, we have four teenagers in our house. So it is a house full of hormones, blaring, and things like that. So it's a really great time right now with us, plus some toddlers in the mix. So it's, it's a beautiful chaos at the house right now. So, But uh, I'll share some more thoughts um, on our ministry and what uh, the Lord is doing in our midst. So, But uh, before I get to that, um, you know, on our topic of resolutions and renewals, um, you know, living in America, we're, we're always seeing on advertisements or looking at other people and their lives and what they are doing in their lives. And one of the things is resolutions. Resolution is a key element in reigning in the new year. Renewal, we want to maybe, we don't do resolutions, but in the new year, we want to start something new, a new habit. We want to read the Bible in one year. We want to... Uh, be at church more often. We don't want to miss church. So we, we want to renew our lives in the new year. So I want to continue that uh, topic this, uh, this evening. And uh, before um, I get into the message, who knows what this is? Uh, Oleg laughed, and I think he knows what it is. And those who are in their late 30s and early 40s know what this is. This is a Nintendo set. This is the first Nintendo that came out Many years ago, it was in two, uh, 30 years ago to be exact, we came to America 30 years ago. In December, we celebrated the 30-year anniversary in America. And this was my first birthday gift. So I will never forget coming from Russia, Soviet Russia, and coming to America and getting a toy like this. It was amazing for a little bit, for a while, until my other three brothers were playing with me, and um, you know how this game console went, is that these had these cartridges like this. So sometimes you would put it in, like Mario Brothers, right? And it would not work. So you guys remember what we did, Vitaly? We would we'd blow on it. We would shake it up. We would throw it in the air and bang it and try to reset it. And then we would carefully slide it in there, gently push it, and then gently push the power button and hoping it will work. Sometimes it didn't work and so we would hit the reset button and it worked and then nobody touched, nobody breathed and it worked. The reason I say this is that in our lives, um, this is what happens in our lives sometimes. We become um, fragmented. We f become needing a reset. We met, we've made some mistakes. We, we said some things to our loved ones uh, we did some things at work, we, we didn't do some things at school, and we kind of cheated, and we kind of do things, and we kind of have this burden carrying around, and we want a reset. We want someone to just reset our life, just put a re push a reset button in our life and reset it so that we can have a new start, so that life would turn on again in a way that would make sense and, and go forward. And so... Uh, I would like for us to think of this as we look at this, because resetting the past is the future to renewal. We have to reset the past. We cannot forget the past and, well, I'll just, let's just move forward. Uh, Paul writes, I'm forgetting the past and I'm moving forward. 
That's what Paul said. But Paul, he's an apostle. His life was renewed. And so he was able to forget, uh, for, uh, ask for forgiveness, repent, and forget, and move on. So, resetting the past is the future to renewal. And we want to look at what God has in his word for us to, to, uh, to create that reset. So we want to look at the story of King David. King David, um, from when he was anointed king to when he became king to, to his end of days, has many examples in his life of how f- for us to, uh, to live our lives. And we want to look at, look at two principles. Two principles, and these principles are based on the story around uh, first, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 11 and 12. This is when uh, he looked, he was supposed to go to war, didn't go to war, looked from his rooftop, saw a beautiful woman, sinned with her, and then the domino effect of sin continued. Ultimately, he kills the woman's husband in order to take her for himself to cover up the sin. And so we want to see that um, what happens when... David messed up. What did he do? What is the principle that he did to reset his life as a king to these people and to his God? So let's look at his life. And, and as we read the story of David um, in uh, Second uh, Samuel chapters 11 and 12, we're not going to read this story, but um, where he talks about that as time went on, after his sin, after Uriah's death, The baby is born, and Nathan, the prophet Nathan, comes to rebuke um, David. But time has passed, nine months, and and David is thinking, oh, it's it's all good, because he knew what was right and wrong. But time has passed, and he moves on with his life. And for us, sometimes we have, we look at our lives the same way. We, as if you remember when we were kids, we were the masters of deception, we were able to cover things up, and when mom and dad didn't come to us, we thought, all is well, everything's okay. But mom and dad, I'm sure, knew. There's a lot of things that I think I hid in my life that my mom and dad knew. Uh, we look around, we, we, we don't see no one looking at us, and we maybe continue to sin. We continue to cheat, maybe at, at school or at work, and we continue to live that unrepentant life. And as we heard already from Ilya, pride Pride starts erupting, and people come to us, and we are defensive, and we continue to live in that deception. But as we look at Galatians, it says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that he will also reap. And, we, and God is justice, uh, just and righteous, and we demand justice. Because when someone, when our, my youngest, our youngest sister uh, it wrongs me, I demand justice from my parents that my parents... Well, we won't go talking spanking, but do some disciplining of my younger sister or my older brother. We want justice. And so God sends Nathan, the prophet, to rebuke David. And you remember the story. And David is convicted. Right off the bat, he's convicted. And here's what he says in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 12, verse 13. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. That is David's first reaction. He wasn't defensive. He said, I have sinned. And this is his first step. This is the reset button that David pushes in his life to renew his life. We cannot move forward. We cannot have renewal. We cannot have a joyful life moving forward if we do not hit the reset button of repentance, of owning our sin. And he says here, against God I have sinned. That is a very important aspect for us to realize is that who do we live our lives before? It is before God that we live our lives. In verse 14, um, Nathan says, "Nevertheless, uh, Nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child who is born to you shall die. There are consequences to our sins. There's consequences to our past. And even when we reset, when we renew... When we ask for repentance, the consequences are still there. The baby will die. But David, he accepted that consequence of sin because he knows who he sinned against. Our sin carries consequences. 
Let me just use an example. They carry physical consequences that we will take to our grave. When we are unfaithful in our marriage, and our marriage can end in divorce. It's a consequence of a sin. Gluttony or addictions that are wrong for us to have can end in heart attacks, diabetes, car accidents. Spiritually speaking, we can lose vision and direction. We can, we cannot know what, what's going on in our lives and we can, we can be stuck. As I mentioned this morning, we can have that stuck effect in our lives because we lose the vision, because the Lord is not with us. That is why when many young people, because of their pride and unrepentant hearts, they don't want to change in their hearts, so they walk away from their Lord. They walk away from the faith. The statistics say that 8 out of 10 college students that go away to college in America end up either agnostics or atheists. Again, as Ilya said, it's because of that pride, because of that unrepentance, because they are unable to reset their relationship with God through repentance. But consequences should not prevent us from repentance and going towards God. It should, if we know our God, it should cause us to run to Him. Because He is able to restore. He's able to renew. And in the midst of this, David writes Psalm 51. This is the Psalm of Repentance. And we can see here, uh, we're not going to read the whole psalm, and you know of this psalm. In the first ten verses, he's asking for cleansiness. He asks God to cleanse him, purify him, uh, purge, he says, verse 10, purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. David is a king. He is clean. He's got the highest hygienics in the kingdom. He's got the best place. He's got the best toilets and everything. He's got the best stuff, but he feels dirty inside. He feels the weight of sin. And then we read in verse 10, that's the key verse here, says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. And there's that word, renew. Renew a right spirit within me. He knew who is able to renew. In these verses, he says, David says that his bones are broken. In verse 9, let the bones that you have broken rejoice. We can physically have brokenness. But David knows who can renew. He knows that he can, his spirit can be renewed because that is what's important. He knows that his spirit can be cleansed because that's what's important. How about you? Where are you hurting? What is hurting in your life? What relationship is not where it needs to be? What relationship is broken? I challenge each one of us, brothers and sisters, that 2019 will be that year of renewal of relationship with you. Maybe it's between your mom and dad. Maybe it's between your spouse. Maybe there's certain things that you had allowed in your life to happen between your wife, between your husband. Maybe it's between your boss. Maybe it's between your teacher. And you feel that there's something, that there's this cloud. Follow David's footsteps. Repent, reset, renew. Allow God to clean your heart and renew. Repentance of the past is the future to renewal. That is key number one. That is the first step. And here's the next step. But before I start with the next step, I want to bring a little backstory, a little a little example, I think, um, I, 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 I preached this message in our church, and um, I think it, this will resonate with you a little bit more. So, growing up in State College, this picture was taken on the back of Calvary Church, the first church where the Russian church gathered. And this is uh, my brothers, me, on, on top, s sitting on that wall, and you know who that's on the bike, right? Maybe some of you. That's Alex Schwenke. And uh, in uh, Khabarovsky Krai, when we lived in Russia, Alex lived across the street from us. And so we always, we grew up together until we moved to t uh, Tennessee. And we always hung out together. And Alex is six months older than me, so we're not going to hold that against him. Um, but he was cooler. He was taller. He was stronger. I was the nerd. I wore the glasses. I was the brains. He was the muscle. And so he was kind of the leader of our group. He was the, kind of the leader of our uh, um, 
family, if you will. He's the older guy and everything. He had the latest things. He had the bike, you know, and he had the watch, and he had the cool stuff. And we wanted to be like Alex, and we wanted to hang out with Alex. So we hung out with Alex. And we hung out with a youth group as, as we grew up. We actually hung up with, hung out at Paul Fomichow's basement. Paul, you remember your basement with the pool table? And some of you who hung out, Alec and everybody, everybody hung out at Paul Fomichow's basement back in the day. It was awesome. It was, it's the highlight of my childhood, to be honest with you, hanging out in Paul's basement playing pool. And so it was one of our Christmas occasions uh, that we were hanging out at Paul's basement and we were playing pool there. And I remember Yura Komlev. You guys know Yura Komlev. And he, he's, he's a friend of mine. He's a good friend of mine. And he was, he was you know, playing pool and he was um, hitting the ball. Um, but there was a f- friends from another state, uh, Molodjosh came, and one, there was a bigger guy, older guy, uh, probably in his early 20s. I was about 15, 16, and Yura was younger than me. And he would come to him and bump that stick so that Yura would mess up. And it angered me. That's, that's what broke my heart, you know. So I, I was like, this is not happening. So I ca- approached this old, older, bigger guy with my glasses, and I said some words that I probably should not have said, and I angered him. He was angry at me. And um, I will never forget this moment because he was wearing a ring that size with the lion's head on it. Oh, by the way, this guy's name is Paul, too. I will never forget his name because... That Paul, after I said those words that were not right to him, uh, because I was upset, he was messing up. So he threw me on the ground and started punching me with that ring. And I remember having that image, having that fist fly at my head. And um, that's the only thing I remember. Um, But um, I was very upset after that. So what do you do when you are upset and you have an older cousin brother kind of guy that his muscle you call him you say hey I was beat up I was wronged and so I called Alex it was around 12 o'clock at night it was like I said Christmas you know how you stay up late Alex was not there I called him I'm kind of like trying to keep my composure said Alex this and that Alex said I'll be right there he comes over and I'm not going to tell you the rest of the story because we did some things that are not good But the point is, here's the moral of the story. We need a helper. Alex was my helper to renew my image in the youth after I got beat up. That is not what you do to get renewed spiritually. And this is what David focuses on in the next few verses of Psalm 51. He needs someone to help him. And look at verse 11. I think we have it here. In uh, chapter 51. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with the willing spirit. David calls out to God for a helper. He, the Holy Spirit, he knows the power of the Holy Spirit in his life. He knows who's able to renew him. He acknowledges who is able to renew him. Do we acknowledge who is able to help us. May we remember this second moment because it restores joy. He says, restore the joy of your salvation. And that is what we want. When we fall away, when we have a mess up with our spouse, we want to restore that joy with our spouse, with our parents, with our boss, teacher. We want that back, that that freedom. That renewal. And when we have sinned and we live in sin, we lose the willingness to go on. We start going to the back seat of the church. We start nearing that back door of that church. Because the willingness is not in us. We're not willing, our spirit is not willing to move on. Because there's something hanging in our lives. And we cannot move on. Maybe we start serving in the church at certain things. Maybe we sang in the choir, and we stopped singing in the choir. The Holy Spirit is the game changer for renewal. He's the source of power for renewal and sustaining longevity. The the work of the Holy Spirit began at Pentecost, when the church was established, when the Holy Spirit came on that early church. 
But during the, during the period of the law, God sent the Holy Spirit on individuals like the judges and the prophets and kings and others to communicate his word and principles for a victorious life. So who's the Holy Spirit? He's one of the three personas of the Godhead, of the God Trinity. So what is the purpose of the Holy Spirit? In our relationship with Jesus, he's the power. He's the muscle, spiritual muscle, to help us through life's most challenging times. Jesus said to his disciples in John 16, 7, he says, Nevertheless, this is already towards the end of his ministry, Jesus says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. He is our helper. Our advantage, of Jesus, uh, advantage is that Jesus being gone is that we have the Holy Spirit. And so then my question is, trivia question, would it be better for Jesus to be on earth? Or would it be, the Holy, would it be better for the Holy Spirit to be on earth? Jesus says that the Holy Spirit, he is your helper. So let's look at this as a, in contrast. You guys remember the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness of the nation of Israel. They were wandering and they were complaining and bickering and, and uh, because of this is not good and that is not good. And so God's like, well, because you're wandering by your flesh, you wanted food, you wanted water, you didn't trust me. He caused them to wander in the wilderness for 40 years until one generation died off, the complainers, so that the next generation can move into the new promised land. The big picture is that Israel was living in Egypt, which is bondage and sin, and wandering the desert, and then getting to the promised land. So we might feel that way sometimes. We might feel that we're wandering around in life, and we don't know where we are going. Because God is not leading us to the promised land. Because there are certain sins. There are certain things that we did not deal with, and we continue to bicker and complain. So that's the contrast. Forty years, Israel wandering in the desert. So the contrast is with Jesus. After Jesus is baptized and receives the Holy Spirit, in Mark chapter 1, verses 19 through 13, we see that Jesus is led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness for 40 days. And I'm not saying this is a coincidence, this will teach us like 40 years to 40 days. I'm not going to go there. But the difference between Israelites wandering in the wilderness for 40 years and having no victory to Jesus being tempted by the most evil tempter, the, the chief of all tempters, and coming out victoriously. Who was with Jesus in the wilderness for 40 days? The Holy Spirit. And that is the contrast I would like for us to know, that he's our helper. Without him, we are dead in the water. Jesus took upon himself all the sins of the world. He was the one that was dirty and broken, as David felt, because he took the sins of the world upon himself. There is victory when we have the help of the Holy Spirit to renew us. And we need that helper for renewal. Because when renewal comes, then joy returns. Then the willingness to continue returns. And here's what the willingness for David to do. Look at verse 13 and 14. Through 15, it says, after he has the willing spirit, it says, then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from the blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. This is the result of the helper and the Holy Spirit after sin, after you've messed up, after you've repented, and the Holy Spirit is in your life. The Holy Spirit causes you to go and to teach and to sing and to praise of God's power and might. That is the result of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And one might think, hold on a second, David, you just really messed up. You're the king and you really messed up. You have no authority to say anything. But the Holy Spirit, he's the one that renews. He's the one that empowers and leads us to continue and so we, as former sinners, now saints in Christ Jesus, have the ability to reach down to those who are drowning, who are away from the Lord in their sin. That we are able, like David, 
to teach the transgressors, to teach the sinners of the renewal that can be found in repentance and in the helper of the Holy Spirit. We see that um, David's son dies after he's born. But God renewed his spirit and renewed his life. And through Bathsheba, the woman that he sinned with, God gives him a second son. And you know who the name of his son? Solomon. Yes. And Solomon brings in and ushers in the golden age of Israel. He's the wisest, most popular, most wealthy. He built the original temple of the Jewish worship. It has been the greatest temple. It was the greatest temple that existed. The entire known world marveled at his success. And this is what God is able to do. He's able to do the unthinkable when we repent and call on the Holy Spirit to lead our lives. And you might think, I'm too far gone. I've messed up so much. I am not worthy. God is able to restore. He's able to restore your future as he restored the future of David. Not only that, but God says twice of David in the scriptures that David is a man after mine own heart. Can God say about that about us? Are we after God's own heart? And the way to do that is repentance and asking for the Holy Spirit to help us. How do you get the Holy Spirit? And I know that some of us know. In Acts chapter 2, verse 38, after Peter preached the first uh, sermon, and uh, 3,000 people are saying, hey, what should we do? They're convicted. He says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Repent and be baptized, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I was baptized in this church, and it is dear to me. Um, I know it's, it was a uh, bold eagle, Howard, that's where I was baptized. And uh, I believe Vitaly and my brother Gene and Mike were also baptized there. And ever since, God has been working on us because the Holy Spirit is in us. Yes, we've messed up plenty of times. First John 1 John 1.9, one of my favorite verses in the Bible, but when you can confess your sins and God is able to, faithful and just to forgive and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Galatians 5, 16 says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. In other words, when we ask for the Holy Spirit to lead our lives, we will not wander as the Israelites wandered. We will not walk through life aimlessly, not knowing where we're going. But the Holy Spirit will give us strength and guidance, and He will lift us up. So, Dear church, as 2019 revs up and we're going to be hitting February next week, may renewal that become, begins with repentance and may it be sustained by the Holy Spirit. Now, I'd like to share with you how God has been leading me in the past 20 or so years as we are, haven't been here in, in State College living in Tennessee. Um, about 12 years ago, our church split. Uh, there was problems in the church, our churches got into arguments, split. My mom and a bunch of uh, ladies, young uh, sisters were praying and fasting that God would send renewal, uh, revival in our church. And God sent Vasily Filat, I don't have a picture with here, uh, um, and he brought us the inductive study method about 12 years ago. That caused that spark in my heart. I was like, there's something there that I have not seen. And it is a method of how to study the Bible more deeper. Um, it, the method is used at many seminaries across the country, so it's not something new. It's just precept ministries took that method and made it user-friendly. As a matter of fact, Martin Luther, if you could take his Bible, if you see the big, he used portion of the inductive study method in his Bible 500 plus years ago. So here's what we do in our church. We lead small groups. Uh, weekly on Wednesday nights, we get together. We have Americans that come. There's actually three Americans here. Uh, 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 Kellen and Jessica Doister, Frank Viola. He's married to a Russian. This is Tanya. This is Jean's wife and, you know, us. So we lead small groups. And through these small groups, we've been doing this for over two years. Um, before, it was off and on. But 
and through these small groups, uh, this is that American family that was, um, that uh, accepted Jesus as their savior and were baptized in our church. So this is the first American family that were not believers, or Catholics actually, and repented and accepted and uh, Jessica and Kellen and their older son Cade, who was, I believe, 13 at the time, uh, were baptized in our church. And now they're serving uh, as small group leaders. Uh, this is Kellen and Jessica. Some of these guys you remember, it was Jana and Diaz, and they're leading this group. This is their small group. They get together every week. Uh, they study scripture, and uh, Kellen's kind of new, and so, but he's trying. He has a great heart for the Lord and sharing his truth. And these are the young couples. And, and this is a marriage uh, weekend to remember. You guys know Family Life that does uh, marriage conferences throughout the, the country. Uh, these is, this is our leaders um, Bible study group. We're studying 2 Thessalonians starting in January. Uh, we have, uh, these are small group leaders. Uh, we have Dima and Evalina, uh, Dima and Larissa, and so on and so forth. So we want to get together with the small group leaders to make sure that we encourage each other, to build each other up, so that they, uh, when tough times come, and they do, usually in relationships with those who participate in the small groups, we are there to pray for each other, to encourage each other. Um, uh, this is our company, Anatole Exteriors. Uh, it has, as we experienced growth in our family, in our church, we've experienced growth, and we have experienced incredible growth in our company. Uh, we do stucco, just like Many of us here do stucco. So, but uh, we have American people, uh, Hispanic. Um, Hilda right here in the middle, she is from Mexico. Um, and I'll tell you why she is such a uh, vital part of our, our company. Um, so our company is growing and we do uh, Bible studies at our company once a week for one hour, Tuesdays from 11 to two right before lunch. I lead a small group uh, at our office using the material that you'll see outside at the table, which you're able to come and, and view this material. This is what we use for as curriculum. Um, and then we have uh, the Mexican crews that work for us. We lead retreats with them uh, because a lot of these guys are, have families in Mexico and they're, they've been in America for 10 years by themselves traveling in hotels. And that is, that is my heart. That my, it breaks my heart that they, they're just kind of they're just, they're just work, laborers, that's it. And what am I? I'm a pastor, and so what am I going to do? How, I have, that's who God given me. That's the audience that God's given me. So uh, I don't know Spanish. I still don't know Spanish except hola and come estas. And that's it. That is why uh, Hilda's here. She's, uh, and our kids are participating in these retreats. Uh, we also, uh, the Priesthood Ministries has a Spanish um, copies of this. And uh, here she's vital because she translates from English to Spanish to our Spanish crews. Um, and the reason that this is all able and, and, and um, possible for me to do uh, and know how to do and be equipped on how to do is because of this institute. I shared with you a little bit this morning, uh, but we set up a table with some brochures. You're, the brochures are free. Uh, so you can take as many as there are, but the books are there just for uh, references so you can look at the material that we use for small group material. But it is, I am so grateful for this institute. I was in this institute for four years. Uh, Vasily Filat, who is in the middle right here. Uh, I'll actually have a picture of him. And then Ion Miron, you guys know, uh, he's the Baptist um, Union in Moldova, um, the overseer there. So he's, he's been part of this. This is in Kishinev uh, about a year and a half ago, or actually a year ago because this is winter. Um, uh, I was able to graduate this year. This is Vasily Filat. He's my teacher and mentor. Um, remember I said this morning that we need to have five, um, the five people that are in our lives who influence us. We have to have the right people. And he is that right person that encourages me and, and, and answers questions that, that I have. He's one of them. Um, so at this graduation, there were uh, people from uh, brothers and sisters from Ukraine and Russia. So we got together here. And in the middle, you see here... Uh, Costell and Mia Ogliche, they are the Precept Ministries International Directors of International, um, Eurasia, South America, Africa, and so on. So, and Vasily is now the Precept Eurasia Director. Uh, this is where the institute is located throughout the world. There are many, many institutes. It is not a building like a seminary. The institute can be in your church. Um, one of the things that is needing is 
the requirement is 25 people. If 25 people sign up, then the institute can be established in your church and teachers can come and teach. And this is in uh, Surduk, Romania, this past summer, um, where I, I was able to graduate. And so this is the, um, the amazing news I want to share with you. Um, this March, 18th through the 28th, is going to be session one. Evangelism and discipleship is the name of this session. It is the first session. It is an amazing session. This is the session I did in St. Petersburg, Russia. And the description is in this brochure. You can pick it up. My email is on the back of this, and I'm on Facebook if you would like to connect with me. These are the nine sessions that are there. Session one is evangelism, discipleship, church planting, family counseling and marriage, homiletics, or, or how to preach, art of preaching, or speaking, communicating, history of Israel, church growth, time management, how to manage your time, because we have a lot of time distractions, covenant and the Bible doctrines, interpreting difficult subjects. The vision of the Institute uh, is to prepare and form leaders for effective discipleship and practical ministry in the life of the local church. Discipleship. Teaching God's word to the next person, our friend. That is the vision of the institute, is to prepare the leaders. Who is the institute for? Pastors and deacons, church leaders, preachers, youth pastors, kids ministry leaders, small group leaders, anyone who wants to grow and be used for the kingdom of God in the local church. So that pretty much is for everyone. So uh, You have to be 18 years old, a member of the church, baptized, and to have two references from your church, from your pastor, as a recommendation to be able to go to this institute. Uh, we can find us on Facebook. We have, um, it's called Precept Ministries Institute Cleveland. We have 14, or actually, sorry, 15 going, 22 interested. So it's from all over the U.S. The people are traveling. So it's not just our church and local churches. It's from Maryland and Mississippi uh, have signed up here as well. Uh, Timothy School uh, is this brochure. It's not my school. But it is based on the discipleship method between Paul and Timothy, uh, his disciple. And it is for teenagers. It's for ages 14 to 18. If you have a 13-year-old or a 12-year-old that is passionate for the Lord, we will take them as well. There is no need to be baptized, but there is an application in this where you would uh, have it filled out with your mom and dad filling out to make sure that your mom and dad allows you to, and the pastor. That these are for serious teenagers who are wanting to grow in the Lord. And the session one is character of Joseph, and Lord, teach me to study the Bible in 28 days. The vision of the school of Timothy is to teach the student to find answers for life leading to transformation and the character building through in-depth study of the Bible. it has been a lot of information, I know, and I'm sorry, but I would like to conclude with this verse from Isaiah 43, 19. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Look around you what God is doing in your life. Renew, repent if you need to where there's something. Ask the Holy Spirit to lead you and see what God is going to do for you in your life in this new year. Amen. Let's pray together. Amen. Lord, we thank you so much for your grace, for your patience. As we read in the Old Testament how you were patient with your people. And now, Lord, as we are your followers, as we are your disciples, we are the ministry of reconciliation, ambassadors of your truth, your love and your grace here in this world. And we, as we walk in this world, as we walk among the sin and um, those who are broken, those who are hurting, Lord, I pray that you would renew us, allow that revival to happen in our hearts first. If there's renewal that needs to happen in our hearts, Lord, convict us, help us to renew those relationships. We ask for the Holy Spirit to empower us, to fill us, to lead us, to remind us of those things that are written in your scriptures. And Lord, help us to perceive the new that you are doing in our lives. You are always doing new things. You are always pursuing us. 
you are for us. And we love you for that because there is no one else. You are our God. You are our King. May we look to you. And I pray that you would bless this church. I, I pray that you would bless the leaders, the young leaders, the next generation of leaders that are rising up. Lord, equip them. And if someone is wanting to come, if, if you're putting on their heart to come to this institute or the Timothy School, that you would create opportunities, open the doors for them to come and to be equipped and to bless their church and to disciple those in their community that are needing, who are hurting and are broken. We love you, Lord. We thank you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.